Happy Sabbath, everybody. All right, so welcome to the house of the Lord this morning. We are here for our Sabbath school lesson. Entitled, Sabbath school lesson for this week, entitled, Teach Us to Pray. Teach Us to Pray. The memory text is found in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, which reads, Now it came to pass. As he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of, his, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught us his disciples. This morning, we are going to study the topic of prayer in the context, in the, in the context of the Psalms. Now, there are two major implications in this lesson. First implication is that prayer needs to be taught. There is a, we should be careful with the idea that we can approach the throne of God anyhow. The first implication is that prayer needs to be taught. And the second implication is that we have to, we don't know how to pray. That's the second implication, that we might not know how to pray. Therefore, we need to be taught how to pray. So there is no better example or there's no better prayer lesson other than the book of Psalms. And this lesson, we are going to investigate how to pray in the context of the Psalms. So we're going to open our Bible in Psalms chapter 105. Verse 5. I don't know if someone could read for us Psalms 105, verse 5. All right. Psalms 105, verse 5. It's written. Anyone? Okay. So I'm going to read Psalms 105, verse, verse, uh, verse 5. It's written. Remember its marvelous works which he has done. His wonders and the judgment of his mouth. What does this verse say? First of all, how can we use the book of Psalms in prayer? With this verse here, we are reminded that we should approach the throne of God with a basic knowledge of what is capable of. Of doing. We should all know that the book of Psalms is there to remind us what God has done in our lives and what is, is, what is his track record. We can't just start prayer, our prayer life, ignoring what God is capable of doing. This is the first and a basic step. We need to acknowledge what God is capable of doing. Now, let's open our Bible now in Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. Colossians 3, verse 16. If, and if someone else could read for us, we'll read, we'll read in our... Uh, thank you. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother. So here, Colossians 3.16 tells us that the book of Psalms is there to give us something to teach about. Something to sing about. Because the book of Psalms is a major source of inspiration. If we are lacking in our prayer lives, all we need to do is open the book of Psalms. All right. Next verse we're going to, sh we're going to read together is in James chapter 5, verse 13. James 5, 13. Okay. Anyone else? James 5, 13. It's, it's, it, it, okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
James 5.13. If any of you are suffering, they should pray. If any of you are happy, they should sing. Amen. Amen. What does this tell us? What does this verse tell us? Tell us what is the major message of this verse here? Okay. Anyone? What, what, what I get from this verse is that we should sing even when, we should sing when everything is going well and even when nothing is going well. Right? Some of us are only approaching the throne of God when everything is going well. But here, here in James 5.13, we're, we're advised to either pray or sing. These are the two things we should do as in, our, in our spiritual walk. Either pray or sing. If something is not going well, we should pray. If something is going well, we should sing. There's, this, those two things have to happen together in our, in our, in our walk, right? So, so this is how we can use the book of Psalms in prayer. Now, in the lesson of Monday, we, are, uh, we talk about trust in times of trouble. Trust in times of trouble. Now, I'm sure any of us here have ever have either wondered why God allowed certain things to happen, some certain difficult things to happen in, in our lives. Why is that in His wisdom... And love, he lets us suffer so much. Why God seems to let us suffer so much sometimes? Right? Why wouldn't God stop calamities from befalling on his children? Now the question I'm going to ask someone, someone here in the audience is, should we normalize expression of despondency in worship? What do you think we should do when we feel like complete a mess, what, what should we do? Should we fake it until we make it? Or should we just basically tell what, should we pretty much tell God what, how, how we feel? Both and. Um, I think going back to what David said, I command my soul to praise the Lord. So um, even when we feel when we don't feel like lifting our hands and worshiping and all this stuff, um, uh, the, the phrase is, you, you got to fake it till you make it. I think in, in those circumstances, the enemy's plan is to get mm -hmm. us to do what he did to Job, curse God and die. Mm -hmm. you know, curse God and, and deal with your situation, whatever. Uh, but it's important for us to remember uh, even how Jeremiah puts it. All this stuff is going wrong. But then, you know, this our call to mind. Therefore, I have hope. It right. is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. They mm -hmm. are new every morning. So um, look for God's faithfulness even in times of discomfort mm -hmm. or distress. So, yeah. Thank you, my brother. Uh, uh, so, in other words, it's okay to tell God, hey, God, it really looks like you let me down today. It really looks like you let me down last week. We should tell God how we feel, right? It's, I, actually, I, I, I would dare to say that it is spiritual dishonesty to always show a brave face in the midst of trials. We should tell God how we feel because what is the point of worship? What is the point of worship? The point of worship is to be honest with God because the failure to express honestly and openly our feelings and views before God in prayer we leave us in bondage to our emotions, right? We should let our emotions bear. And the good news is, God will not censure us. God will not censure our openness. He will not censure our honesty, right? The book of Psalms is here to show us that God is okay with us telling us, uh, telling him how we feel, right? Tell God how you feel. Now, I want to be careful now to say that there is a way to approach God and to, and, and to tell us how we feel, right? Let's look at on, uh, uh, Psalms 44, how Psalms 40, 44 begins. Let's, let's uh, open Psalms 44. I'll read for us Psalms 44. Now, in Psalms 44, I want to, I want to mention that it is 
David praying, right? Is it's to the chief musician? Is it to the song of Korah? He he is praying. He's pretty much telling God how he feels. But before he does that, watch what he does. He is saying, "We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us." The deeds you did in their days. In the days of old, you drove out the nations with your hand. But them you planted. You afflicted the people and cast them out. For they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword. Nor did their own arm save them. But it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance. Because you favored them. Why? How does this chapter start? Did you guys notice something? Here. Even when, I mean, I'm sure if you read, continue to read the chapter, the psalmist is actually going to tell God, hey, you really let us down. You, you really, it looks like you really abandoned, abandoned us. But before he says all this, how does the psalmist approach God? How does he approach God? The psalmist approaches God with a feeling with a sense of reverence, sense of worship, sense of acknowledgement of God's power and what, a God, and, and what God has done in the past. We can't come in, into God's throne forgetting what God has done for you in the past. It's crucial for you to recognize that even in the midst of your trials, even in the midst of a sense of abandonment, we should not forget what God has done for you in the past. Right? So this is the right and correct way to approach God even when we are about to be open right, and, and, and honest uh, 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 with Him. Right? So let's open now in the book of Psalms uh, chapter 22. Someone else could read for us please. Uh, uh, Psalms 22. All right. Psalms 22. I want, we're going to read from the first three chapters, please. The first three verses, please. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you don't hear. And in the night season, and am not silent, but you are holy. Enthroned in the praises of Israel. Amen. Can someone tell us what is, is this prayer? Do, do, do you recognize this prayer? Who said this prayer? That was Christ, right? Christ at the cross. He literally telling us, why have you forsaken me? He's talking to his father. Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me? Why are you not helping me? I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. Is that true? Can God really not hear when we cry? Is it possible? Have you ever felt that God is not hearing our prayers? Okay. So, so the point of this, of this reading, of this psalms here, is that the psalmist is expressing his viewpoint of the situation. It's okay to express to God our viewpoint of our current situation, even if it is not true. We should open be open with God. But then the verse, the, the, the verse starts, uh, continues by saying, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted in you, deliver them. Again, we should continuously acknowledge what God is capable of doing and what God has done in the past. Because there has never been a night so long that the morning never came. Darkness may seem so dark now, but it can't resist the light. The psalm teaches to look beyond our current situation and by faith see the time when our lives will be, will be restored. Yes, it may seem completely hopeless right now, but it will be okay. It will be Okay, the book of Psalms here reminds us that no matter how fierce the battle is today, the Lord of hosts has already won. Amen? The book of Psalms here reminds us that God can take our burdens away 
without censoring us. This is why we can move from lamentation to praise. This is why we can address the one who holds tomorrow, right? We should be confident that when we speak, he hears, right? This is the point of the book of Psalms. Now, let's open our Bible again in Psalms chapter 13. Psalms chapter 13, starting from verse 1 to verse 6. Can someone please read for us? We're reading the book of Psalms a lot this morning, and this is for a reason. So Psalms chapter 13, verse 1 to 6. Oh, so, wait, someone is coming. Sister, yeah. Thank you. Is it on? All right. Testing. How long will thou forget me, O Lord, forever? Hmm. How long will thou hide my face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy exalt, be exalted over me? Mm. Consider and hear me, O Lord. My God, lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Amen. Amen. Now, I, I, don't know if, I don't know about you, but I keep seeing a pattern in the book of Psalms. And it's a pattern that I'm actually inviting all of us to avoid. It's a pattern of focusing ourselves in our problems during prayer. Focusing on ourselves and our problems during prayer. That's a pattern. That is a dangerous pattern. Because this can actually lead to bitterness. It leads to uh, 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 um, egocentrism. Right? And as this is this pattern that's going over and over again. We're looking at the words I, me, every time. Now, when we pray, we should develop the habit of praying for somebody else. Intercession. Right? That will take us away from our problems to somebody else. Because when we take our problems from ourselves to somebody else, it gives us the sense that God has when he provides. The sense of providing, the sense of caring from someone else, for someone else. It, give, it gives us a sense of trust. That what God is capable of doing for us, he can also, he, he can also do it for somebody else. It would, allow, it would allow us to be content and be grateful for our current situation, right? So this is, this is uh, the lesson. This is the lesson here on, on Wednesday. So when you read Psalms chapter 13 from, one, from um, 1 to 6 here that we just read, what else do you notice from these verses, from these verses we just read? Psalms 13, 1 to 6. Again, we're still in Wednesday. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a sense of sadness, it knows this, and at the end there's hope. Because, guys, we, we need to remember that there is no situation that we've ever gone through that, nobody, that somebody else has not gone through. Right? right? Humans like the rest of us, surely we have all faced similar things. Though yes, you know, at times our sins generally bring trials upon us. But at other times they can seem unfair. And we feel as if we did not deserve what we are faced with. Again, we've all been there. We've all gone through the same thing. So the two things that we, 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 we can see from the book of from Psalms 13, 1 to 6, is that we are showing, we are seeing here that the Lord will not forget us. 
Even though we sense, we, even though we sense, we, we sense that he has forgotten us. Even, we, even though we sense that he has, forgot, he has forsaken us, that is not the case, right? We are wrong, right? But as we said in the beginning of the lesson, we should be open and honest to the Lord about our viewpoint of, of our situation, okay? So, now another thing I wanted to point out here in this lesson, uh, in, this, um, in this verse we just read, that is that there is a re repetition of the words with only a slight comprehension of their meaning. What are the words, what is, what is the words here? Yes, I'm reading from Psalms chapter 1, 13, verse 1 to 6. This repetition of words here. I'm, I'm inviting you, you guys to see a pattern. How long? Yes, that's the one. That's one one. That's another one. Next one. <clears throat> By the way, what does a how long means? When someone says how long, what is he usually saying by that? That he's waited too long, right? He's, suffer he's been suffering too long and he, he needs to stop, right? So what else is he saying? I'm sorry? Last? Less, okay, less. Like, I mean, that means unless, right? What else? There's one last one. Enemy, maybe? Yeah, enemies. Yes, good. So there is here in a in this succession of patterns that we see here, that the psalmist is focusing on his own perception of the problem. So this is the pattern that we, I'm inviting us to avoid as we pray, right? We should focus, we should shy away from focusing on our viewpoint, right? So the thing is here, when we pray, even though we need to be open with our, uh, about our current situation, our current viewpoint of the, of of our, of, of our issues, we should not forget that God is in complete control over everything. And he sees and he hears and he's not insensitive. All right, let's move on to the lesson of Thursday. Oh, restore us again. Oh, restore us again. That is in Psalms chapter 60, verse 1 to 5. Psalm 60, verse 1 to 5. Can someone please read for us here Psalm 60, verse 1 to 5. One through five. 16 or 60? 60, 60, sorry. 60, okay. God, you have rejected us and scattered us. You made the earth shake. It is shaking. Verse 3. You have given your people trouble. You made us unable to walk straight like people drunk with wine. Verse 4. You have raised a banner to gather those who fear you. Now they can stand up against the enemy. One through four. One to, yes, one to five, sorry. Okay, five. Mm -hmm. Verse five. Answer us and save us by your power so the people you love will be rescued. So the question I'm going to ask you is that when you read uh, when we read Psalms one to five, we see accusations. You have done this. You have done that. Is it okay to accuse God of things that He has not done? How do you feel about that? How do you feel about this approach that the psalmist is having? Because I mean, I am pretty sure God has probably not done these things, but He is accusing God of doing these things. So in our prayer. Should we accuse God of doing things that he has not done because we think he has done, he has done these things? Uh, well, I think you can accuse only when it's like something that God promised. Like, because the Bible says that like, God promised this and I promise you that. So if it's something that he promised, I think you can. Yeah. Hmm. 
Anybody else want to add to what the brother said? Should we literally go on and blame God and accuse him having, or having a, an accusatory approach in our prayers when we feel hurt and bitter about things? Yes. Uh, you had said this earlier. You said perception. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a perception that we have. It's a mindset. It's not our fault that these things are happening. It's your fault. So we take the blame off of ourselves and put the blame on God. Mm. So we don't take any responsibility for what we do. Amen. Guys, I'm, I, I, I'm sure as a human being, we have come to a place of lamentation, crying, absolute pain. And when we are in pain, what are the things we usually do? What are the things we, we usually say? We are hurt and we say hurtful things. We are completely devastated. We say things that we don't even, sometimes we don't even mean. Now, does it mean that we should avoid these harms even in, uh, 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 even in good times? Because sometimes they may be a total disjunction between the words of the Psalms and the worshippers' present experience. Psalms of lamentation can be beneficial to worshippers who are not in distress. Again, psalms of lamentation can be beneficial to worshippers who are not in distress. Why is that? Why psalms of lamentation can be beneficial to us when we are not going through these things, these difficult things? What, what do you think they are beneficial? They can be beneficial. I said first, the most basic thing why they're beneficial is that they can make us aware that suffering is part of the human experience. Right? We are, we, 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 it's, it's normal, it's natural to suffer. It happens to the righteous, both the righteous and the wicked. These psalms also assure us that God is in control and he does provide strength and solution in times of trouble. Even in these psalms that we just read, even in the midst of trouble, even when God seemingly made the earth tremble, the psalmist still portrays and, and, and presents hope in God. Because as I mentioned, there has never been a night so long that the morning never came. God is still in control. There's always light at the end of the tunnel. The second, the second reason why this is beneficial is that Psalms teach us compassion towards sufferers. Even, though we, even if we have never been in a point where we are accusing God, by reading this, it gives us a sense of compassion and puts us in someone else's shoes. And, that's, and this, is, this feeling is crucial, it's, it is a, it's a feeling that is crucial in our quest of uh, 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 intercession. We can't intercede for someone if we can't be in their shoes. We can't pray for someone if you're unable to feel what they feel. Otherwise, you'll be superficial, you'll be completely, uh, uh, prayers devoid of any sense. We should feel what someone feels. And this is why we should read these Psalms, right? Um, the next thing is that um, um, we might have things good, you know, things may be good right now. But who doesn't know people all around us who are suffering terribly? So praying such psalms can help us not forget that those who are going through these tough times exist. They are there and they need prayer. They need God's assistance. And this is why we should pray for them, right? So the, word is, the, the world is a vast house. Christ came, came to heal the sick. And there's something that I love when uh, I love uh, 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 Christ for, is that before he healed someone, there's something that the word says he felt. He was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion. I, I really love that. It's so deep that before 
he even extended his hand to heal or before he even restored the sight to the blind, he felt compassion first. Brothers and sisters, we have to feel compassion for our brothers and sisters. The world does not revolve around us. In our prayer lives, we, are, we have this tendency of just focusing on ourselves and how the, the, the skies are falling on our heads and how we're suffering so much and how God has forgotten us. No, the Psalms are there to remind us that we are here for each other. We're here to bear each other's burdens. We're here to pray for each other. So when we are unsure, yes, uh, yes, sister. So uh, one of the things that stuck out to me in this lesson about compassion was compassion for ourselves. Mm. I think sometimes, like, there are two extremes where we're so stuck in our ways mm. that we don't see anybody else. Mm. But there's that other extreme, I think, where we are sometimes so um, stoic in our Christianity that we are not authentic. And one of the things that came across in this lesson that you addressed a little bit earlier was about how they're like, were you said, can you accuse God of uh, things he hasn't actually done to you? And I'm like, well, when you feel like somebody's done that to you, shouldn't you be able to talk to them about mm. it? Mm. When you feel like uh, somebody is not there for you, closeness in relationship mm. means that if I have an issue with you, then I should be able to bring that issue to you and say, hey... I feel wronged by you right now. That's what friendship does. That's what relationship does. Mm -hmm. And I think the Psalms invite us to be in authentic relationship with God. But one of the things that it always does is, again, we don't want to be on either of those extremes. Sometimes we have to feel that compassion for ourselves. Like, you know what? I am upset mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And I am sad right now and I feel like I'm in the pit right now but one of the things that the psalm the psalms do is they allow us to look outside of ourselves to God so if I I am thinking about my friends who are in despair or I'm feeling despair myself I don't have to live there because even when I'm in despair God is still God, mm -hmm. and those promises that he presented to me are still true. And that compassion that we extend to others, I think we also have to extend to ourselves. And the Psalms invite us to do that, but not stay there, amen. but move beyond where we are. All right. Amen. Thank you, sister. All right. So I'm going to summarize the entire lesson for those of you who joined in the middle of the lesson. The, 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 the lesson is centered on prayer in the context of the book of Psalms. The first implication is that prayer needs to be taught. The second implication is that we may not know how to pray. So this is why we are, in, we are, we are, we are, we are invited to read the book of Psalms to be inspired on how to pray and how to talk to God. The second thing I want, the second thing I wanted to summarize, is that God will not censure our expressions of pain. He is okay with us telling Him how we feel, even if we are saying we are saying and accusing Him of things that He has not done. He is okay with, with with us presenting our viewpoints of our current situation. Is okay with us being honest about our feelings. We, we, we talked about that it is it could be spiritual dishonesty to always show a brave face in the face of trials. Right? The next, the next thing we said is that the book of Psalms is there to tell us that God is open. It, 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 that God is open to hearing us, to hear our pain. Now, the next thing we, we talked about is that even though we may feel what we feel, difficult things we may feel right now, the book of Psalms is there, is, is there to, to remind us that there is always light at the end of the tunnel. 
And then because God is in control of tomorrow, because God is the one who holds tomorrow in his hands, we have light at the end of the tunnel. Okay? The next thing we talked about is that we should refrain from focusing on ourselves in our own problems during prayer. Because in order for us to feel the compassion that God feels for us when we pray to Him, we should feel the same compassion for others. In other words, we should put ourselves in someone's shoes. And sometimes when everything is going well in our lives, when everything is going smoothly, we don't, when, when we don't have any problems, we should read these psalms when someone is actually pouring their hearts out to God and, and, and wondering what God has seemingly, seemingly left them alone or forsaken them so that we could feel what someone else feels. That is, a, that is a, the, the first step in intercession. Right? So this lesson is to inspire our prayer life. This lesson is to guide our prayer lives. That even though, even though we are speaking to the God of the universe, even though we, are, we, 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 are, we, we have to be opened about our feelings, let's be reminded that we can't approach the throne of God before acknowledging what He has done for you in the past. Right? God is so faithful. Even though we feel today like complete mess, and, and we, may, we may seem to forget that what God is able to do. We should, we should take some time and write down that God is able to do this, God is able to do this for me and that for me, that this will not be above Him. All right? So this is the lesson we had this week. I hope it was a blessing to you, it was a blessing to me. And I hope that as we journey through this life, we should be, we should, we should be reminded that God is in control and that he cares for us. Amen? Let's, let's pray. Let's pray to end the lesson. Father Lord, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for your faithfulness. We want to thank you for your compassion towards us. For the fact that you hear and feel our pain. For the fact that you are open to us pouring our, our heart out to you. We're here this morning to ask for forgiveness for every time when we fail to think of others when we prayed. Lord, give us a spirit of compassion, a spirit of care for others, that when we pray, that we should remember others that are maybe facing similar or worse situation than us, Lord. So that in your grace, that you will fulfill each of our desires in time, because there is no night so long that the morning never came. You are all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving. Thank you for this reminder, and thank you for your scriptures. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Right where you are, let's begin to worship God because he's been so good to us. He's kept us in all that's going on in the world today. He's held on to his people. We've got death all around us. We've got heartache all around us, sickness, disease. But God is still watching out for us. He's still holding on to us. He's still making ways for us. Is anybody having that testimony right now in the midst of this pandemic? That in spite of it all, God is still awesome. Come on, let's say this together. My God is awesome. My God is awesome. He can move. He can move mountains. Hallelujah. Keep me in Keep the me in valley. valley. And hide me from the hide rain. Me from the rain. Come on, let's say it together. My God is. My God is awesome. We're looking for a healer. He and he's the strength that we need to make it through these days. Can we say that together one more time? Come on, my God is awesome. I can't help but smile about it when I think about him. Why he loves me so, I'll never know, but I'm thankful for it. Thank you, God. Come on, my God is awesome. Heals me when I'm broken. And he's the strength I need to make it through. 
Praise him right where you are. Come on, we're going to the chorus here, everybody. My God is awesome. Go on, lift it up to him. Awesome. Right where you are, praise his name. The whole world. you, God. Under his 
his wings I am safely abiding There will I hide Till life's trials are over Shelter protected No evil can harm me Resting in Jesus I'm safe evermore
so faithful Not because I've been so good You've always been there for me To provide my every need You were there when I was lonely You were there in all my pain Guiding my footsteps Shelter from the rain And it was you That made my life complete You are to me my everything And that is why I sing Jesus, I love Because you care I couldn't imagine If you weren't there Jesus, I love you Because you care peace in my storm Your loving arms protect me You're the shelter from my harm You are Alpha and Omega The beginning and the end My strong tower My dear Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Oh. Sabbath is a happy. It is. Welcome back to Mass Mission. You're supposed to say day. Day. Yeah, thank you. Welcome back to Mass Mission. My name is Jada Williams. And I'm Audrey Johnson. Jada, this is our first time here this year. It is. Last week, life was lifing. We're happy to be here. Good to see the Matthews. Heard you had a big event in your life recently. You all have moved into a new section. You have a daughter in love now. Congratulations to Jordan and Candace. Yay. All right, Jaden, we got to do last week and this week. We got to hurry up. They told us to say what we have to say and get on off the stage. All right? One of your friends is on there from last. Actually, oh, that is one of your little friends. All right, who we got? Kendall Burton. She turned 11. Last week, happy birthday to Kendall. She started her week, her year off with a birthday. That's pretty cool. Happy birthday, Kendall. Sherry Wilson. That's Dr. Jesse Wilson's wife, my former boss of me. Happy birthday, Sherry. We love Sherry. She's awesome. All right, hold on. I don't see her. She'll pop in later. All right, next one. Adrian King. Happy birthday, Miss A. Adrian King. Last week she had a birthday. Our assistant treasurer. Give her a hand. She keeps us up to date. Last week. Come on. Tanya Gowdy Marsh. That's Sister Gowdy's daughter. Happy birthday to Tanya last week. All right, moving to this week. We had a big birthday. Somebody turned the whole 15. Who's that? Kendall Walker. He Happy birthday, Kendall. I was trying to see if he was on one of the cameras. He's not this week, but he's probably in Sabbath school. Yep. Did you go to Sabbath school today? Oh, okay. Patrick Douglas. Happy birthday, Elder Douglas. Have you had his greens before? I, I don't know. You have. They were really good. He cooks very well. Happy birthday this week to Patrick Douglas on the 7th. He's funny, too. All right, somebody else turned 15 this week. Gabby Jackson. Gabrielle Jackson. Can y'all, I see your face, Sister, Sister Matthews. Can you believe she's 15? I can't either. Gabby Jackson is 15, our associate pastor Jackson, Jonathan Jackson's youngest daughter. She's 15. Shamari Burden. Yes, Shamari, happy birthday. Oh, huh? Oh, I don't know how old Shamari is. Shamari should be pushing... He's what? Somebody say 34. 24. 24? 24? Oh, wow. Happy birthday, Shamari. Wow. Wow. Okay, go on. 
Jeremiel Johnson. We call him Mel. Mel Johnson, he sings tenor on the praise team. Happy birthday, Mel. No, this week on the 8th. Happy birthday, Mel. You were looking for him, see if he was coming in the door. He's coming, don't worry. All right, this is our former youth pastor all the way in Frederick, Maryland, right down the street from my mama. Jason Francis. Happy birthday, Pastor Jason Francis. Hope he had a good one. All right, this is one of our favorite people in the church. Michael Green. Happy birthday, Michael Green. I don't see him, is he? He might be coming in, he's, you know, he pops in. That man still has a lot of energy. He just caught up to me again. Happy birthday, Michael, all right. V Roberts. Happy birthday, V, yes, and one more. I don't wanna miss that. Patrice. Patrice Grant. We just call Ms. her Pat. Pat. Miss Pat. Happy birthday, Patrice Grant. Today is her birthday. It's nothing like having a Sabbath birthday. And guess who else's birthday is today? Anika Sampson Anderson. The Lord be praised. One of my BFFs. Happy birthday, Anika. Did you call her? I text her, and I sent her a gift. I think that's a good thing. We like gifts. At this age, just send the gift and send a text. Happy birthday. Right? You want more than that? Oh, all right. Did we miss anybody? Any birthdays or anniversaries? When's your anniversary? January 8th. Y'all have an anniversary a day apart? 30 years? No, y'all got to stand up. Happy anniversary to the Matthews. 30, that means y'all got married in 1994. You know how I know that? I got a high school anniversary coming up this year. <laughs> Just had to put that one in there. Happy anniversary. Oh, I love it. Oh, anybody else? That's a big one. We got everybody? I think so. We'll get you next week if we didn't. All right, I'm Audrey Johnson. And I'm Jada Williams. Have a happy Sabbath. Madison Mission, my name is Brianna and I'm here to give you your Sabbath announcements. Directly after church today will be a youth department potluck. So all youth members and parents of youth, please stay for a potluck and quit chat, okay? On January 20th, the evangelism training with Pastor Daniel Hall will be here at Madison Mission. 2024 is our year to amp up our evangelism efforts. We want everyone involved, so come out, support, and lunch will be served. January 21st, Church Cleanup Day. Let's get together to beautify the house of the Lord. January 27th is our Tennessee River Youth Federation. There will be a Friday night play here at Madison, divine worship at Oakwood University Church, and much more. Also on January 27th will be a in-concert guitarist, Mr. Roland Grinsham, and his guest, special guest vocalist, Miss Brenda McKenzie, will be at First SDA Church starting at 6 p.m. on January 27th. Please come out and support. Again, youth practice for the choir will be every Friday at 6 p.m. And any of the announcements will be due to Miss Michelle Tuesday morning by 9 a.m. Thank you, Madison Mission, and have a blessed Sabbath.
Sabbath Church. Happy Sabbath. It's a happy day. We're here to praise the Lord. Is, did anybody come here to praise God? Is anybody thankful? Is anybody grateful to God? Come on, let's praise Him. You can be on your feet. You can sit. You can praise Him any way you want to. But let's just praise Him together. Praise Him. Come on, say praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him.
Amen, amen, amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. So it's a new year. Y'all feeling good about it? Yeah. I was thinking, um, I have a CDL license, and so occasionally I find myself, I don't drive semis, but I drive the big charter buses, you know. Uh, I work at Oakwood, so I drive theirs. Um, and I thought about it. Have you ever noticed how big the windows are on those buses, the front windows? But have you ever compared it to the side mirrors, the rear view mirrors? Not rear view, because you can't see the back of the bus. And there's a reason for that. Our focus in 24 is not what's behind us. Our focus is where we're headed. In fact, um, my wife was helping me find a scripture on the way here. I was looking at, uh, she was looking at Isaiah 43 for me. And it talks about actually what? Forgetting what's behind you. Um, don't look back. Focus on what's ahead of you. And <clears throat> there's not a, a lot of young people here today, but one of the, the worst things that you can do as an adult is focus on what you've done in the past, on accomplishments, what it was like when you were in college, because those days are way gone, <laughs> you know, once, once you're past college. So if you're like me and you need the Lord to do something new for you in 24, you want to press towards a goal, towards a closer walk with him, a better relationship, maybe with your family, with your loved ones. Uh, you want to become a, a, a greater spiritual witness um, in your day-to-day -day activities, in your work. Um, I just encourage you to, you got to forget what happened last year. No matter how many souls you baptized last year, it doesn't matter. It's a new year, right? Let's press forward and let's push towards um, the goals that the Lord has set for us. And that, that's for us as a church as we're getting ready to go into this um, evangelistic campaign. We've got to push forward. We've got to set new goals. And I'm, I'm making a commitment to be more committed, you know, more locked in with Madison, more locked in. My pastor's looking at me kind of shaking up, but you know, I'm gonna do better pastor. How about that, okay? <laughs> so it's time for prayer. It's prayer time, Madison Mission. So if you'd like to join me for prayer, I'm doing the welcome. Wow. They changed the program on me. I didn't know I was doing Hey, welcome to Madison Mission, where love is an action word. <laughs> so grateful to see you all here. I did not know this was a welcome, but you all are welcome. I'm so glad to see everybody. Take a moment and <laughs> greet somebody who's close to you, and hopefully somebody else will come and pray for you. How about that? <laughs> Happy Sabbath. Stand up and greet your neighbor, okay?
we just want to bring everybody to a, a spirit of worship, a spirit of prayer, and just call you to bow, bow down and worship God, bow down and honor Him, give Him your adoration, hallelujah. Worship Him, say bow, bow down and worship Him, worship Him, worship Him, oh worship Him. time for prayer bow your heads with me please dear father in heaven lord we are so thankful thankful father that you know us and yet you call us friend you know us father and yet you you claim us as your children you know us inside and out you know our secrets. You know the, the things that we don't tell anyone. Yes, Lord. And yet you love us. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father God, for delivering us. Some of us you've brought, all of us you've brought a mighty long way, Father thank God. You, through trials and tribulations and vicissitudes, Father God, you've You've lifted us out of the miry clay, out of the horrible pit, Father God, and set our feet upon a rock. And Father God, we lift you up today. Yes, sir. We give you honor, we give you glory, we give you praise, Father God. We worship you today, Father God, just because you are who you are in our lives. Wretched people that we are, Father God. Forgive us for our sins, Father God. Uh, uh, help us to continue to work on our character defects, Father God. The little things, Father God. None of us have, have, have arrived, Father God. But we ask that you continue to walk with us, Father God. To walk before us, Father God. To guide us and to lead us, Father God. And to show us the way. Help us to walk in your will, Father God. So... Uh, many of us have tried it our way, Father God, and it, it, it didn't work out. So, Father, we give ourselves to you. We reconsecrate ourselves to you this year, this new year, Father God. This year. This Father God, we lift up all of those that are on the prayer list. I read through them and people are hurting, Father God. Families and children and marriages and adult children Father God illnesses, cancer, death Father God people all over the country are hurting we need your healing Father God heal our land Father God we lift up our pastor today and uh, Pastor Abernathy and all of the other uh, uh, pastor, Pastor Jackson, Father God. We lift up all of the elders, all of the leaders of the church, Father God, to help us to reconsecrate ourselves, to be more in line with your will, Father God, to, to, to roll up our sleeves, to be willing to get our hands dirty, Father God, for you. All of us, Father God, it doesn't have to be a pastor or or an elder, every person in here, Father God, yes. we are willing to get our hands dirty, Father God, for you to, to till the land for a new harvest, Father yes. God. And Father, we ask that you give us a word today. Mm -hmm. We need you, Father. Desperately. It's rough down here, and I know you see it, and I know you don't like it. 
but we need a word from you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Say worship him. Oh, worship him. Oh, worship him. Say bow down and bow down and worship, and worship him. Say enter in. Consuming fire. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Madison Mission. Oh, y'all can do better than that. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Madison Mission. It is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're going to try it one more time. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Madison Mission. I am so happy to be here this morning. Listen, it, it was a little cold this morning. <laughs> And, and if you've been looking at the forecast, next week is going to be, Lord have mercy, cold. Uh, but God is still good. Uh, though it's cold outside, it's warm here on the inside. There are a couple of housekeeping things uh, that we need to uh, take care of before uh, we move on. Uh, I want to uh, give notice uh, to Madison Mission that we have some new members of the family uh, here with us. Amen, amen. Uh, so K Kamari uh, and Corey, if you would just stand, wave your hand. Uh, these two lovebirds, they are about to be married uh, and they are, have joined the Madison Mission family uh, and we just want to welcome you uh, and we love you already. Uh, and we want you to know that you are a part of the Madison Mission family. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. Listen, just for, for the sake of, 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 of doing it, uh, is there a motion to accept? Kamari and Court, so move. Is there a second? All right. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, the door is there. Don't let it hit you. Oh, we're the good Lord. Okay. Amen. Listen, this morning I am excited because it is time for our Mission Minute. And I, I want to do a little quiz this morning to see if you were listening last week. Uh, what is our goal? How much money do we need to raise in-house for this, this, this uh, evangelism push that we're having this year? How much? 30000 Okay, all right. Listen, I want you to know that before we left that church... Last week, we had $5,000. Listen, listen, that's not reason to push the brakes. That's not reason to stop. We need to supersede what our goals are because God is still in the, the saving business. Do you believe that? And he is going to use Madison Mission in this part of the vineyard uh, in this season to win. How many souls did we say that we're praying for? We're praying for how much? Listen, do y'all believe that we can win a hundred souls in this Madison area? 
Are y'all excited about what God is going to do uh, in this 2024 20, year? Uh, uh, y'all don't seem excited. I am dying and sitting on the edge of my seat with anticipation because God's power is going to be manifest in his vineyard. And we want you to be a part of this soul winning process so much so that on next week, when did I say? Next week, we will have the evangelist himself, Daniel Hall, who has done a phenomenal and excellent job on innovating soul winning in the 21st century. So this is what we want you to do. First of all, we want you to be there. You need to be there when? Next week, we will have a meal for you. And after the meal, we will go into our workshop about how we can learn how we each individually can get involved with this soul winning process here in Madison, uh, in, in Madison at Madison Mission. Is that all right? So next week, we want you to be a part of that. There will be food, so you don't have to leave. We absolutely want our elders and our officers there, but it is open to the church at large. Amen? So be with us next week as we endeavor to kick off our year right uh, and learning how we can get involved with the soul winning that God has charged to us for each one to win one. Amen? So I want you to stand to your feet. As we get this in our DNA, our, our, our mission here at Madison Mission. So, so take a deep breath and let's read together. Madison Mission is a community of faithful, innovative, relevant, and energetic believers committed to making more and better disciples. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. And just before our offering, we have our treasure who is going to come with some important announcements for you today. Good morning, Madison Mission. Just want a quick announcement. Quick announcement. I don't know if Ian, somebody can put it up on this. Yes, he got me. So you guys are asking for your contributions. We get a lot of emails in our regular treasurer uh, email account. So we created an email account for you all to send uh, your request directly to this email for contributions only. So that way, only contributions. No questions will be answered. Only contributions. It's contributions.madisonmission at gmail.com. Send your contributions. Send your full name so I'll know who's asking for it and we'll return it to you in email. If you want it, a paper copy, you can call the church, leave a message for Michelle. She'll write it down, send it to us, and we'll either have it to you here, or if you want it mailed to you, we can mail it to you. But if you want it email, email is the best and quickest way to receive your contribution statement. Send us uh, uh, a request to that email address. It'll come to us, and we'll send it right back to you. Give us time, because there, there, there's, there's a lot of you. So... Please bear with us. We'll try to get it to you within a 24 to 48 hour period. All right. If we miss it, you know, just come and say, hey, Ty, I sent it and, and I'll check it and we'll get it to you as soon as possible. All right. Thank you. All right. I'm back. I'm on task this time. I promise you. So Madison Mission, quick question for you. Can you beat God giving? Have you tried? Anybody tried? No, no, that too, okay. But I guarantee you, you can't beat God giving. His promises are true, he's faithful. He says, be faithful to him and he'll be faithful to you. And I know there's a lot of witnesses for that. So Madison Mission, it's offering time. So let's have a quick word of prayer. Lord, we're so grateful for your continued mercy and grace. We're grateful for the way that you continue to make a way for us over and over again. Please honor our faithfulness, increase our faith, and bless these funds to enhance your kingdom. It's my prayer in your name for our sake. Amen. God is able. Amen. Amen. Why don't you turn and tell your neighbor, God, God. is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you could ask. 
or think. Can you go ahead and stand on your feet to praise God with us today? Please stand on your feet and praise God with us today. Oh, oh, oh yeah.
has done. He deserves the glory, the adoration, the worship. And just for that, we give him the glory. We give him the praise, the praise that he deserves. Our response today to everything that is done, all of 2023, all of the years past, and our response to what he's going to do in the future is hallelujah. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life, and I'm never going back. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life, and I'm never going. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. And I'm never going back. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. You have you have rescued my life. I'm never
rescued my life. You have rescued my life. And I'm never going back. So you have rescued my life. 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 Good afternoon, Madison Mission. Good to see you on this Sabbath afternoon. Before we pray today, let me greet those of you online. So grateful that you have joined us today. We pray that God uh, blesses you uh, as you have been worshiping with us. I solicited your prayers this morning. I'm feeling bad uh, this morning. I'm struggling a little. So I solicit your, no, I'm serious. I need your prayers. Amen. Amen. Pray, pray for the pastor. I also want to uh, send a welcome and a greeting uh, to some, uh, to the pastors and some families that are here today. Pastor Earl and Juliet Daniel are sitting over here. Marlene's parents, good to see you all on today. And I don't know if there are any other pastors in here today, but God bless you that you're with us today. Of course, my good friend, Pastor Leon Willis, uh, is here with us today. And uh, we, 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 I think we are indirectly, uh, we kind of have this running joke going along that we are indirectly showing people uh, that Adventists and other folk can get along. Amen. <laughs> 
Amen, amen. A good friend of mine, love him to death. Prayer warrior, uh, one of the strongest and craziest believers that I know. Uh, believes God for the impossible. And I do mean the impossible. And we're grateful, grateful that he is with us here this morning. Listen, uh, going to, let's go to a familiar text, Acts chapter 2. Go ahead and stand to your feet. We're in this series asking you the question, are you on fire? That's what, we've been talking, that's what we started last week. Are you on fire? Acts chapter 2. That's where we are. Start at verse 42. If you got to say amen. Amen. The word of God says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen, amen. Listen, I'm just talking to you today under the subject, are we community? Are we community? So again, go ahead and take your seats. Last week, we began that series talking about are you on fire? The word fire, uh, as you see in our mission statement, is an acronym of made up of the four letters uh, or four words, the first letters of the four words in our mission statement. That says, Madison Mission is a community of faithful, innovative, relevant, and energetic believers committed to making more and better disciples. And last week, I asked you the question, uh, the first acronym dealing with faithful, are you faithful? And in that, in that sermon, we acknowledge that all of us are depending on God to be faithful. Are you still depending on God to be faithful? Yeah. Amen. We're still depending on God to be faithful. That's what we said Last week, we are depending on God to be God and, and, and for God to do what God says he's going to do and can do. And we declared last week that our survival and existence is solely contingent upon being of God, on, on God being faithful. And when I gave this definition of what it means to be faithful, I said that being faithful is simply staying true to your word. Uh, I, I learned last week that I said being on business when it should be standing on business. And, and that's, what, that's what faithful is, is being about. It's, about. it's It's about following through on your commitments. It's about keeping your promises. It's doing what you said you would do. Uh, it's, it's being consistent in what you believe and how you behave. It's, it's being consistent in what you promise and what you perform. And, and I want to reiterate, uh, because when I talk about faithfulness, I'm not referring to faith as an ownership or possession. I'm emphasizing the degree to which the Lord and others can rely on you to fulfill your commitments and follow through on your promises. And I'm referring to, when I talk about faithfulness, I'm referring to, Dr. Wilson, a living faith or an active faith. I'm talking about the type of faithfulness that embodies the virtues of godliness and demonstrates them in practical everyday life. I'm talking about the type of faith that says, I love you and you actually mean it. I'm talking about the type of faith that says, I'm praying for you and you actually do it. I'm talking about the type of faith that, that will hold me accountable, that will check me when I'm wrong and be kind to me when you're doing it. I'm talking about the kind of faith that Jesus would check us on in the day of judgment when he asked us a series of questions. When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you give me drink? When I showed up at your church, did you invite me to your house? When I was naked, did you expose me or cover me? When I was sick, did you come see about me? When I was in prison, did you vi visit me? And I need to ask this because, listen, it's easy for us to get stuck 
on being hungry, thirsty, uh, naked, and sick. In other words, many look at these, these, uh, uh, these characteristics, Cassie, these, these statements of Jesus, and immediately go to self-pity. Yeah, pastor, when I was in need, the church didn't do nothing for me. When I needed my rent paid, the church didn't do anything for me. When I was lonely, didn't nobody come and visit me. But I need you to understand, family, that these verses in Matthew 25 beckon us to shift from victimhood and ask ourselves, to what degree have I not been these things to other people? Let me make this point by asking this question. How many times, I'm talking about being faithful, how many times have you relied on God to be something that you refuse to be? The Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 1 Peter 1, 14 and 16, it says, As obedient children, as he which had called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And this holiness that God is calling us to is not some superficial form of godliness. This holiness that God calls us to is character development. In other words, the text is saying because God has called us out of darkness into this marvelous light because through Jesus we've been rescued from the clutches of the enemy and have been saved by grace through faith because Jesus has saved us from darkness and has reclaimed us as sons and as daughters. Jesus said, because you are my son, because you are my daughter, you better act like you belong to somebody. My wife used to tell our kids when they were younger, when they would go, when we start allowing them to go by their friend's house, she would remind him, uh, act like you got some home training. Act like you belong to somebody. Act like you represent somebody. When are we going to embrace the fact that we don't act like we belong to God? And so this holiness, God is calling us, if you claim my name, don't embarrass me. Stop calling on me and not represent me. Don't even lift up holy hands if holy hands ain't grabbed you. Oh, I can spend some time there. I, I got to go. I got to go. I, I don't want my wife looking at me like I'm crazy because I, I could spend some time uh, how people come to the house of God uh, and they leave the same way they came. Now, I don't expect the house of God to be perfect, but we got to be better. Amen. We, we, you know better, you do better. Now, all I'm saying, listen, is that the teachings of Jesus on how to live in relation to other people is radical. Because how Jesus demonstrated faithfulness, Sam, uh, his demonstration of faithfulness is at odds with how we live and how we do things. It's, it's not even, it, it, it doesn't, it, it, it's, it's opposite our, our nature. Like, like, for instance, how, how, how many of you watch the series Chosen? Have y'all been watching, you, you watch the series Chosen? Anybody remember the episode where, uh, uh, where Jesus calls Matthew as a disciple? And when he calls Matthew as a disciple, uh, Peter had already been chosen according to Scripture, so it's trying to go along with Scripture. And, and Peter, had all, Peter had already been chosen, and so when Jesus chooses Matthew in, in, in this series chosen, Peter has something to say to Jesus about it. And basically, Peter objected to Jesus choosing Matthew. Why? Because Matthew was a tax collector, and Peter had problem with the fact that he's a Jew, but he's also a traitor. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord, break it down. Uncle Tom for some of you black folk. And so in this episode, Jesus chooses Matthew, and Peter is like, Jesus, I don't, I don't get your choice. 
And, and, and in, a, in, a, in a series, Jesus responds to Peter by saying, you didn't get it when I chose you. Then Peter's like, it's Jesus, but wait a minute, but Jesus, this is different. Y'all know how it is when we try to act like our situation is different from somebody else. And so we act wrong, but justify the same behavior when we do it. Like we want folks to forgive us, but when they hurt us, we justify why we can't do it for somebody else. Here it is. Here it is. Jesus, like uh, Peter's, like Jesus. This is this is this is different. I'm not a tax collector. And Peter's Jesus simply responds to Peter by saying, "Well, get used to how I do things because how I choose folk is going to be different than what you expect." Thank you, Pastor. In other words, Peter, get ready for things to be radically different than what you think. And I need to tell Madison Mission, we got to get back to being radical. This used to be, this used to be a radical church. Church that wasn't afraid to do stuff different. Church that wasn't afraid to not follow the beaten path. Church that, yeah, let me, let me stop there. I, yeah. Used to be, where that church at now? Where you at, Madison Mission? You thought that being radical was wrapped up in who you used to be? Where that church at? Where's that church that didn't mind doing anything different? Where's that church that lived beyond people's expectations? Where was that church who defied the odds when they said this church couldn't be built, would not grow, would not make it? Where's that church that existed where every pastor in the city was against it? Where's that church at? Where, where you at, Madison? Where, where is that church? For eight years, I've been waiting on that church. Waiting on those folk to show up. I didn't like Madison, Michigan, because y'all was arrogant, and I couldn't stand it. I ain't like y'all when I was over the yonder the other way. Yeah, when I was down yonder. Love Pastor Dog, and I ain't like y'all. Y'all, y'all, y'all thought y'all was too good for everybody. But I'm wondering, I understand it now, and I'm asking the question, where's that church? Was it about your worship, or was it about the people? Was it because it was popular, or was it because it was Jesus? Where is that church? I'm just asking where the Bible, listen, I'm trying to tell you that it's time for us to be radical. And for the, for the, for the other Adventists that are in the room, for the other Adventists that try to say that when the Bible says we're a peculiar people, it's talking about us. I ain't talking about y'all Adventists. Because we ain't the only peculiar people in the world. But it's time for us to be radical. And, and I'm not talking about acting like we're better than anybody else. I'm talking, I'm talking about being in character who God has called us to be for him and for each other. I'm talking about being radically different in how we live with each other as a community of believers. Jesus was radical then, and his teachings, if we follow them, are still radical today. How often have you been challenged with loving your enemies?
The word ain't changed in 2,000 years. He still says, love your enemies. Watch this. He also says, bless them that curse you. Wait, gee, listen, Jesus is digging. Y'all, y'all got to get this. He's digging in on this text. Each level of his command uh, goes higher and higher. Not only does he say, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, he says, do good to them that hate you. Yeah. Woo, he's digging in. And pray for those who don't just use you, uh, but despitefully use you and persecute you. Jesus like, I don't care what they do to you, pray for them. Woo! Oh, this is radical living. This kind of teaching from Jesus makes us uncomfortable because it confronts who we are and who we have been. Jesus talked to and got acquainted with a Samaritan woman. This was radical. Jesus allowed himself to be touched by a woman who had a continuous menstrual cycle for 12 years. Radical. My God. Jesus told a woman who was caught in adultery when the law of Moses said she was to be put to death. Jesus blessed her and said, go your way. Radical. Jesus allowed himself to, to be touched and dealt with ministries with paralyzed and blind people and we don't want to even deal with the folk right here in front of us. That's radical. And you think that Jesus wasn't radical. He told the thief on the cross who as far as we know uh, had no baptisms, uh, didn't go through 28 fundamental beliefs. Uh, but Jesus said, uh, because you asked for it, you get eternal life. No baptism. Never heard of an Adventist. But yet, he gets eternal life. Then he get approved by the Jews. But Jesus gave him eternal life. That's radical. And this is what God is calling us to do when I talk about being on fire. He's calling us to this kind of radical faithfulness that follows him uh, no matter what anybody says. Now, I got a whole lot more to say. Because it's, it's time for us to do something different. I know I spent a lot of time on this, so let me get on. Because we talked about that first scripture last week being faithful believers. That's what we did last week. And I need to back up. Because the mission statement says that we are a community of faithful believers. I live in a community called Branch Creek. It's a small community. It's only been around since 2019. 29 houses. And in 10 minutes I can walk our entire neighborhood. And as I mentioned last week, live, we live in an HOA. Those of you who live in an HOA, you understand how the rules and how living in the HOA work. The thing about being in an HOA is that uh, you don't really have to live in it to really be in community. Uh, the area where you live uh, is community, uh, uh, even if it's not in the HOA. In fact, all of us are in some type of, of community. Uh, community is not limited to your immediate neighborhood. Outside of your subdivision, your neighborhood might have a name. That's part of your community. The city where you live is also part of your community. Expanding outside of your neighborhood 
uh, and outside of your city, uh, and, I, and there, there's, there's, there's a, the county that you lived in, and, and outside of the county, there's a, there's a state that you, you get the point. We all live in community. The word community is defined as a feeling of fellowship with others, sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. The common interests we share, because we are a biblical community, the common interest we share is our connection to Jesus and the cross. And when you live in biblical community, you agree to be committed to radically do life together with other people. I don't care who they are. They're part of this community. You have agreed to do life with other folk. I don't care where they came from. When you become part of God's community, you agree to do life with folk that not like you. And I'm trying to understand, when are we going to get used to this idea uh, that that church ain't perfect. I'm probably getting away from my nose, so let me get away from them for a minute. All of y'all, all y'all, look, look at your neighbor and say all of y'all. All y'all, look at your other neighbor and say all of y'all. Y'all ready for what I'm about to say? All of y'all, the camera, all of y'all. Y'all ready? All of y'all are messy. Everybody on TV, you watching me today. All of y'all, y'all, I'm from Memphis, y'all. Messy. All of y'all got issues. When I say y'all, I'm talking about me too. We all got stuff. Why are we getting mad at each other when we got stuff? Why are we running around church acting like we ready to be translated? The last time I checked, ain't none of y'all Elijah, ain't none of y'all about to be taken up without dying. My Lord. How is it that we live life thinking that we got it made and have the right to look down on other folk? It's, let me go back to my note. I'm, I'm, I'm getting off track. Let me, I'm going to come back to that. I'm getting, I need to stay on track. I need, I need to stay on track. Listen, let me, I'll come back to that because I, I got some more I need to say about that. Listen, when you live in biblical community, you agree to be different. You agree to live life together. When you are living in God's community, you agree to encourage each other, to hold each other accountable, to pray for each other, to care for one another, to speak life to each other, to study God's words together, to promote and support each other. I'm sick of signing up on Wednesday on Zoom and seeing 12 of y'all. Okay, 15. <laughs> Wife said it's more than 12. 15. And it's only 15 of y'all because we started another series. If we stopped the series, y'all wouldn't come. And I'm trying to figure, they must know something that I don't know. When do we get to the point that we don't even have time to study with each other? Knowing good and well, if somebody came up to you and asked you, explain the gospel of Jesus, you wouldn't be able to do it. And that's why for, listen, I'm, if, if you're getting offended, good, because I want you to do better. That's why with most of us, the only conversation we still have after being in church for 30 years is the Sabbath. We can't talk about grace. We don't understand faith. You got the nerve when the pastor says, come study together so we can pull something into your raggedy behinds. Yeah, I said it.
I filled out a survey one time asking somebody why they don't come to prayer. I mean, you know what they said? Well, pastor, because I, I, we, uh, because, because I, I don't, we ain't, ain't really learning, learning nothing from where you present. I'm sorry, Doc. I'm on the soapbox today. <laughs> Doc, uh, Doc Wilson gonna counsel me after this is over. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, it's really not that I'm venting. I'm tired of living in a powerless church. Pastor Willis and I talk about that all the time. Reading all this, I, I, I didn't bring, I, I, reading all the stuff we see in the Word. And the church functioning without power. That's that's my burden. Is that every week we we shout and we sing and we jump and we dance and we walk out of here without power. And I'm talking about myself because when I go to the hospital and visit somebody, I want to lay hands on. That's the kind of power that I'm looking for when somebody becomes a member of this church. I want to see them actually be changed. When they come to the people of God. That's that's what I want to see. But the problem is that we're all messed up. And ain't nobody messier than the perfectionists among God's people who sit around pointing out the beam and everybody's eye while ignoring the plank in their own. The truth is, maybe it's anger or greed or lust or gossip or bad relationships, laziness, jealousness, or jealousy, insecurity, pride, and anything else you want to name. Our lives are saturated by sin and damaged by dysfunction. And, and listen, uh, everyone in this room, every person online, if you belong to a church, all of us are part of the problem with living together in community. Oh, mercy. The very nature of our shared experiences means that each of us possess flaws and struggles. But I need you to catch this now, Lance, because the beauty of, of all of us that are so different and come from different backgrounds, the reason that God is trying to show us the beauty of living together in community is by the very fact that he came to live among us. The Bible says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The work of salvation, the saving of humanity could not be accomplished from the throne. It had to be done in a body temple. It could not be done in heaven. It had to be done on earth. God came to a messed up community. The gospel came to a messed up community to reconcile the world to himself and he had to physically do it. He had to live with us to save us. And that's the beauty of what God is trying to show us who come from all different walks of life and have all different kinds of issues and problems. Uh, we just need to be like Jesus and learn to live with each other. And I would even add, even live with each other in our messes. Oh, some of y'all ain't with me today. It's all right. So listen, listen let, me, let me get to my points. Here it is. 
Here's how we can live in community. This is, if you want to be on fire for God and, and live as a faithful biblical community, four things I want to tell you. First thing you need to do to, 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 to make this happen is the text already says it. It's easy. It's simple. It's nothing complex. The text says we got to be devoted to each other. Acts 2, 42, verse 43 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking bread uh, and to prayer. Some of the best days of my life in ministry happened right here. Let me tell you when they happened. When I would sit right there in that seat and somebody under the Spirit of God would feel pastors struggling and folk like Benita Taylor would come lay her hands on me and start praying. And D. Florence would, when I would walk through the door, D. would walk up to me, Pastor, how you doing? And as soon as I say fine, she gets to praying, oh, Lord Jesus, she just starts praying right there. Or, or people, who, who does I put in here? People, people, like, people, like, people like Mike Green, who sends me a text every single week for eight years. Just said, Pastor, how you doing? Got you covered, praying for you. How about somebody like Sister Francis, who's always walking up smiling? Pastor, I'm praying for you. We, I believe it, because I and what you all don't know. See, here's what I don't tell you. What I don't tell you is that the times that you walk up to me and praying for me, I have just gone through one of the most difficult emotional battles in my life. I'm talking about living together and responding to each other. We've got to be devoted to one another. Second thing, I'm done. Second thing, two more, three, three more things, I'm done. The second thing, if we're going to be a favorite community, we've got to be more compassionate towards each other. Ah, uh, Acts 22, 44 and 45, all believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their possessions to give to everyone who had need. Now, before you start squirming in your seat, the passage is not telling you to go sell all you got and give to it. I think that would be counterintuitive. I can hear somebody saying, now, Pastor, I ain't, they ain't selling everything I got. Jesus is just going to have to work with me. Uh, because I don't work too hard for what I got, and I'm not giving up all my stuff to give to somebody else, because if I give all I got, then I'm going to be poor. The early church was moved by power. I need y'all to hit me on this one. And it was a power of the Holy Ghost to sell possessions and to give to the poor. Their capacity was stretched to do things they had in and of themselves no power to do. The Holy Ghost fell on them to sell their possessions and give to the poor. But what does this mean for you? Would you, as a member of God's house, allow yourself to be extended beyond your own capabilities and abilities under the influence of the Holy Ghost to benefit somebody else. That's the message. In other words, are you willing to show the type of compassion to someone else to be faithful to God on behalf of someone else in less than trusted circumstances? I, let, me, let me say it like this. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. When I, uh, some of you know that before I started pastoring, I, I traveled and opened I work for the North Alabama franchise of, of um, quality restaurant concepts, which own a chain of Applebee's. And I was a corporate manager and a manager and a training manager and so forth. And, 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 and I left here and I, we moved to Birmingham in 1999. And before I got there, it was already worded that we got a Christian coming as a manager. That's, that's how serious it was. It was that serious because at the restaurant, there were two homosexual men. And they were concerned that the new boss that was coming was going to have this, this Christian boss was going to have some type of feeling about them. And for six months, I, I don't have no business. I don't know you like that. I'm not addressing it. I, I, I see you. It's, it's obvious, I, you know, but, but we have a working relationship. You want to talk to me about Jesus, we can engage, but that ain't the time for this. Six months later, they both came to me and said, thank you. And I said, why? They said, because we were afraid that when you came, that you would ostracize us, mistreat us, because you're a Christian. 
So thank you. I'm going somewhere with this. Are you willing to show the type of compassion to someone else under the Spirit of God to be different than you normally would be on your own? And so one of the guys and I got into another conversation, and again, he's thanking me. And so I said, well, hey, just, just out of curiosity. He was like, David, I believe in Jesus. You know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, okay, great. I said, but what if the Lord, Jesus himself, showed you another way? His response is, even if Jesus came down again, I wouldn't change. It never changed the working relationship. Wow. Wow. How many people can you be opposed to and still treat them with respect? Listen, let me ask you a series of questions. Listen, what are you willing to do when God moves you? Are you willing to forgive even when it's unforgivable? Pray for when they pray on. Are you willing to love when you, uh, the people that you think are unlovable? Are you willing to intercede when nobody stands in the gap for you? Come on, come on. Mm. What did Jesus do for us in less than unfavorable circumstances? The Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, but with his stripes we have been healed. All of us, like sheep, the Bible says, have been gone astray. All of us have turned to our own way, yet God's compassion moved him to, despite us to lay on Jesus our iniquities. What are you willing to do when the Lord lays his hand on you? Oh, my God. I, I know I'm taking some time with this. I'm, I'm almost done. One of the reasons Jesus was baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit is so that in, y'all know Jesus was human, so that in his humanity, he could be able to be stretched beyond human ability for your sake and mine. I know that don't, that ain't fancy enough for some of y'all. But how to create it don't allow himself to be mistreated. The creator be mistreated by the creator. That's Holy Ghost. Stretching him to be more than he could be in his humanity. We're talking about community. I bet most of y'all don't even remember that three weeks ago, I walked in with a visitor. Who's asked about him besides me and Pastor Abernathy? We're talking about growing. One of the biggest issues in Huntsville, Alabama, is that sometimes we act like Hollywood. Or, or let me, we act like Hollywood marriages. We marry each other, and as soon as something go wrong, we divorce each other and move on. And so we go from this church, I bet right here, let's see, Madison got 700 people on their roll. Oakwood probably got about 2,000 people on their roll. Uh, New Life probably got about 800 on their roll. And some of y'all are in all the churches. Because you get mad at the pastors at Madison, so you roll on over to First Church, and you get mad at some over there, so you're going over to Oakwood. And that ain't, we ain't preaching right, so y'all going down the state line. Jesus. 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 Wow. All because you don't know how to live in community. And then you expect for Jesus to be kind to you. We're 
going to be a faithful community, we got to, the text says, we got to, we need frequency. Text says, every day they continue meeting together in the temple. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. Frequency means I might be inconvenienced. But community supersedes individuality. And one of the reasons why we can't be frequent with each other is because we don't like each other. And we don't like each other because we don't know each other. And we don't know each other because we don't spend enough time together. 2018, right here at Madison Mission, second year being a senior pastor, I started noticing that the 20-year members on this side didn't know the 20-year members on this side. And the 25 members, 25 year members in here didn't know nobody on either side. And I'm like, how? Huh? How you been here for 20 years? And you've been here for 20 years. I know you and I've been here two years, but they don't know you've been here 20. So here's what I did. Somebody remembers, I, 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 Michelle, you remember, I think you remember, I, I, I said, we're going we're gonna to put on some name tags for a few Sabbaths because we're trying to build community. We're trying to get to know each other. I'm trying a new thing. And I saw on Facebook the next week somebody dragging me because I'm trying to help the folk be communal. Uh, communal. You mad because I'm asking you to know your neighbor? I just, I don't, I don't, under, and so I'm trying to figure what is it that we, we, we want from God. The Bible says, listen, the text says that they spend, and I know, listen, it's unrealistic. The text says they spend every day together. Listen, we got to go to work. We got children. We got responsibilities. But one of the main reasons for people that don't stay in churches is because of the lack of frequency. Folk fall in our churches and they leave because they don't know anybody. Folk don't use to stay because of good music. I know somebody in here right now, I'm not calling the name, uh, who left somewhere because she sat there for four months and nobody said anything to her. How you sit in the congregation for four months? And nobody reaches out. Nobody calls you. Nobody says hello. My Lord. That's, that's not community. We got to do better. We've, we've got to do better. Listen, what precipitated the Lord, listen, and, 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 and let, let, me, let, me, let me just move on. Listen, so, so we, we, we've got to do better. We, we've got to have some frequency. We've got to do more than just showing up here on Sabbath late. Move the time to 11.30 so you can enjoy your Sabbath morning more and you still don't get here at 12 o'clock. Except I'm, I'm, I'm going to give Doc Wilson an excuse. He got ADD. So I... <laughs> I'm telling you, going to counsel me after this over with. Doc, I'm going to still need you to pray and, 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 and advise me. But, but listen... It, it, I'm trying to have fun, but in all serious, listen, if we, if we want a community to grow, we, we've got to do more than just meet here on Sabbath for two hours, barely say hello, and go on about our business. Church don't grow like that. All right. Last thing, last thing, listen. Text says, listen, we want to be a faithful community. We, we got to work on growing. The Bible says, and the Lord added to that number. Somebody, y'all come on and play. Wayne, come on and play. I'm done. I'm done. The Bible says, Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Ah. What precipitated the Lord adding was the type of engagement from the church. Simply put, they, they actually did life together. That's, that's what made them grow. They really looked out for each other. And God was able to add to them because God trusted them to do right by the people he led to them. And so here's the thing that we forget. The Bible says in John 13, Jesus, I'm going to give you a new command. 
You got to love each other. Lord says, in the same way I loved you, you got to love one another. Has Jesus ever been there for anybody in their worst time? Yeah. Can anybody testify that the Lord has answered some prayers? Anybody child ever been rescued? Anybody, anybody still praying for their child and, and as much trouble as they get into, the Lord just seemed to rescue them and keep them. Anybody ever had a check show up in the mail? Rent got paid. Anybody done some of the worst sinning in your life, but God convinced you, showed you that he has forgiven you and washed it all away? I ask you those questions because Jesus says, I got a new command for you. Love one another in the same way that I loved you. If I've given you the capacity to be there for somebody, Jesus says, I was there for you, be there for them. I forgave you, forgive them. I allowed you, I accepted your apology, accept it when they say I'm sorry. Talking about living in community, and the benefit, the blessing of living in community, in this biblical community, is that God is called. Listen, here's the power of living in community. And I think I said it, but I'm going to say it again. The power in community is God's ability to have us all in here together without killing each other. Do you know what would happen in this very room if God withdrew his spirit from all of us? But the fact is, he is demonstrating how he came into the world and how he has the power to deal with people who under normal circumstances would cut each other's throats if they had the chance. And the power of the gospel says, I'm going to bring all these folk together who people are going to wonder, wow, that person's getting along with that person, that person's doing this for that person, and that person's doing this for that person, and that person's, man, she praying for him after he done done that to her? Wow. Wow. Oh, as a witness to the world. So that when people see what's happening among the community of God, they're just like, wait a minute, hold up. That, that's some real change going on in there. So, so how you deal with being a single mother? How did you deal with being an abandoned child? How do you deal with struggling financially all of your life? Ah, that's because I belong to a community. I can't remember the pastor's name. I was watching something on YouTube and, and this pastor was in Chicago. <clears throat> He's celebrating the church's 54th anniversary. They started the church in 1952. And, and he had a member, a charter member, and, and it was her birthday that day. They were celebrating the anniversary and it happened to all, it was a church anniversary and it happened to be the, the anniversary of her 54th year at the church. And he stood up and they celebrated and he told the story. He, he told the story of how early in her membership at the church her husband died. And the family was calling her to come back to the state of Indiana. Come on back and, and, and stay with us and, and, and come on back and we'll take care of you. And she said, uh-uh, I ain't coming back. I got a church family. My Lord. 
And for the next 52 or so years, she stayed at the church because she had a community that looked after her. She trusted them to do what they said they would do. And I'm just wondering, can we be trusted to not only do what we say we're going to do, but be who we say we're going to be? Listen, we're trying to baptize some folk. And I'm trying to build a relationship with God where he trusts me with what he's going to give me. And I'm just wondering today, is there anybody here that wants to be trusted by God to care the right way for folk? But here's where it's got to start. It's got to start right here. It's got to start with you and you and you. You mad at somebody in God's house? Go apologize. Go, go make it right. Go Go fix it. If you know you done hurt somebody, go say, I'm sorry. Don't walk by people that are hurting and, and do nothing about it when you have the ability to help. Because God wants to build a community. I'm asking you, where that church at? That ain't right English, but where that church at? Where is it? Jesus says, can I find that kind of faithfulness in the earth? I want to be a part of a church where lives are actually changed, where miracles are performed, where blessings are poured out. Or perhaps God's going to lay on somebody's spirit that somebody's sick, they're going to walk by their shadow and get healed. Pastor, that's, that's what I'm hoping for. It's, it's ideal, and I think sometimes we, we don't believe it because we're not really used to seeing it. But faith is not based on what I see. It's based on what I believe. And I believe that God can make us the type of church that, that he wants us to be. And I'm asking you today, if you're willing to live in God's community and be who God calls you to be, why don't you stand with me as we pray? Father, we're grateful. God, we need you to survive, and we need each other, God. Because it's, Lord, if I could just be plain, it's hard out here in these streets. Lord, it's, it's even harder to trust people these days. And Lord, you, you, you've been good. You've been good to us. You, you've, you've rescued us. You, you've helped us. You've, 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 you saved us from, from stuff and, and, and damage and, and hurt and, and pain. And, and, and God, we, we praise your name for all the things you have done. But, but I've got to admit, Lord, that, that, that I have not, we have not been all that you have been to us. And so, God, today I, I'm just challenging the people of God to, to if they're going to be here, to be willing to live in community. God, this church has a history of doing things that's not possible. Oh, God, but I bet if we, if we adapt that attitude of, of living the Father in the impossible, believing that things are possible, we can be everything you've called us to be and more. So, God, I'm, I'm, I'm calling on you, God, to, to fill us with your spirit. That's what you did on Pentecost. That's why they were able to do what they did. That's why they were able to be the community that they were, God, because you filled them with your spirit. 
Lord, I, I know it's going to be tough. Lord, but you said all things are possible to him that believes. I believe it, God. I believe, dear God, that you're going to give us a harvest, dear God, and you're going to teach us how to love one another better. Lord, let it start with me. If there's no love in the church, that's because it's not in me. So start with me. Start with us, God, and help us to be everything, God, that you have called us to be. Lord, we said we are a community of faithful, innovative, relevant, and energetic believers committed to making more and better disciples. God, start with making more and better in us. Oh, God, so that we can be who you need us to be for other people, we pray in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody, say amen. Amen and amen. church at. I have been a part of church families from Nashville to California to Huntsville and now I'm here and people people ask me why 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 Madison Mission and I say I know my pastor I know his vision. And then we've met some beautiful people here. And I want this to be the most powerful church family that I've ever had. I need you all to use me. Don't look at me and, and see the things that I can't do. Look at me and see the things that I can do. I, I can get on my rollator and go in that kitchen and feed all of y'all within an hour. That's what I can do. And make you wonder how. Use me. Reach out to me. I have wise counsel. I've lived a little bit. Use me. If you're struggling with drugs, if you're struggling with illness, if you're struggling with, with, with relational issues, use me. I'll be your brother. I'll be your uncle. I'll be your stepfather if you ain't got a father. That's what I'll be. That's why I'm here. I want to get my hands dirty. And I mean that. God's been too good for me not to serve him. I'm obligated to serve him. I'm obligated to serve you. Father God, you've seen what is going on in this place today. Help us to be the church that you would have us to be, Father God. We want to be the church that you would be proud of, that you would look down and smile on, Father God. Change our hearts, Father God. Open our souls, Father God, that we may be receptive and open to love not to be afraid to be transparent. 
Father, protect us while we are away from each other, Father God. Be with us throughout the course of the week. Be with our pastor, Father God. Help him to feel better. Keep him strong, Father God. Do not let the enemy take his strength now. Not now, Father. We got something to do. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You can consider yourselves dismissed. an incredible time here at Madison Mission. Pastor Marlene is in the building today. My, my, my. It's so good to be in church. Listen, I just want to ask you real quick, if you can tell me 30 seconds, as we're going through this time of revival, so to speak, Pastor talked today about community. Absolutely. This is Madison Mission where love is an action word. So in your own words, how do you believe that we can love on our community and what type of transformation do you think we'll begin to see in individuals as we do that? Mm, uh, well, actually, Pastor said that love is an action yeah. word. So it's a verb. Yes. So if we begin to live that, love that, and express that every single day, I believe that the community will experience it and grab a hold of it. Mm. And then it will become transformative, not only for us as we see it, yes. but also in the community at large. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I yes. thank you for that word. Yes. Praise the Lord. And we praise the Lord for you too thank as you so well. Much. Listen, we want you all to be able to come out here to Madison Mission and join our community where we are loving on each other, each and every single week. We believe that God is going to do amazing transformative things in your life and we don't want you to miss any of it as we are helping you to walk out your journey with him. So I also have Sam. Hey Sam. Oh, happy, 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 Sam happy. is one of our young adults here at Madison Mission. And Sam, I want to ask you as we talk about community as well, specifically as a young adult, how do you believe that actually coming to church and being a part of community has transformed and changed your life and why it's so important for those who might kind of be on the fence about it? Wow, that's a good question. Um, 
I was funny that you're actually asking. I was watching a, a quick little clip sermon on you know Instagram is a little 50 second clip, mm-hmm. and he's like, when you become a Christian, you automatically a part of the body of Christ. Yes. Um, and when you're a part of the body of Christ, you grow within it. And I could just only testify from, from my own experience that when you're in a part of a community, you can go down, like, I hate to put it this way, like, you literally texted me yesterday when I was going through a crazy spiritual battle at my, at my mm-hmm. job. And that's what happens when you're part of community. That doesn't happen at home, which yes. it can be a good Band-Aid or even just good, it's like a snack, mm-hmm. you know? But if you want a good meal of what's coming straight from the Word of God, it happens from people that are just like you. And it's words of encouragement. And it really also really boils down to what Pastor talked about. It's the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And when he reaches with inside of us, he makes us who we're, who he wants us to be, who we're not naturally. And then we talk to other people. We give words of encouragement like yes. what you did for me yesterday. And that's what I believe happens when you're part of community. That you just kind of experience it. It's yeah, beautiful. It's beautiful. absolutely, it's absolutely. Beautiful. We love our community here at Madison it. Mission, yep, Madison especially Mission. our young adult community. We Come on, shameless plug, right? 100%, 100%. <laughs> so, so listen, we want to welcome all of you out Come to through. Madison Come Mission, through. no matter what your age is, but especially our young adult community. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have incredible young adults like God Sam. Is great. God is we great. have young adults who are on fire, 100%. who are innovative, 100%. who love God, and who love each other. 100%. Amen. They want to make heaven their home. Absolutely. So we welcome you to join us next week right here at Madison Mission so that we can embrace you and love on you as well. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you so much. And I believe we have Pastor Abernathy that is going to come and join me as well. Pastor, welcome, welcome, welcome. So listen, Pastor, our senior pastor has been on fire the last couple of weeks. We have been in this series that we started. It's a four-part series. For those of you who may be new to it Mm -hmm. this week, um, where he's talking about, are you on fire? And we are really revisiting and reviving our mission statement here at Madison Mission. I want you to tell me what these past two weeks have done for you Mm. and how you feel like this message is really helping you to be revived and just set ablaze and what you believe that it will do for others as well. Right. So... Um, as, as one of the leaders here at Madison Mission, it has required me to do a little introspection okay. myself uh, to make sure I'm on my P's and Q's because I can't, I can't say, as Paul said, mm-hmm. follow me as I follow Christ yes. if I am backsliding. Yes. Uh, so Pastor has absolutely uh, put fire, proverbially, yes, <laughs> under sir. my behind to, to make sure that uh, I'm being as faithful as I can be and that God will multiply by efforts in my faithfulness uh, to, to win souls for his kingdom. Amen, yeah. amen. So we know that we have some spectacular things coming Absolutely. up towards the middle part of this year as we talk about evangelism and all of those things. But even right now, as mm-hmm. we go throughout this series, specifically this message today on community, mm-hmm. what would you say to those individuals who may be at home watching, but they're like, uh, I'm not really too sure that I want to come out just yet and join the community? Well, that's all right. Let's see the good thing about uh, the digital age that we live in is that you can absolutely be a participant yes. on whatever platform you're watching on, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, if you see clips on Instagram, you are absolutely a part of our community, our digital disciple, if you will, mm-hmm. Apple Apostle, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, if you will. Uh, and we absolutely feel you. And more importantly, when we solicit prayers, mm-hmm. Uh, It's not only the prayers on the inside that are helping what's going on. It's absolutely the prayers going on around the world for what we are endeavoring to do uh, in winning souls uh, for God's kingdom here at Mass Mission. Amen. Amen. Well, you've heard it from our pastor as well. Listen, we want you to be a part of our community here at Madison Mission. This is truly a place where love is in action word. And I'm so grateful for the fire that pastor is lighting us on um, as we go throughout this four-part series. This has been week number two. I encourage you that if you need to go back and revisit the word from the past two weeks that you do, because I know for me, I have been revived, you have been revived, and God is going to do so much more. So we have two more weeks in this sermon series about are you on 
fire yes. and we don't want you to miss it. So welcome, join us, come on out. We would love to receive you here at Madison Mission where love is an action word. This is Antonia Simons and Pastor Abernathy. We wish you a happy Sabbath. Thank you so you. much. Just to say